Well, thanks very much. You know, this time of the year, end of September, beginning of October, is a very exciting time in the science community because this is when the Nobel Prizes are announced. And uh, the <clears throat> prize for uh, medicine and physiology was announced today. So I want to talk a little bit about that because uh, Nobel Prizes, of course, are, are uh, you know, uh, momentous uh, awards. The, uh, the money that uh, is now um, given to the winners, which is about more than a million dollars per prize, is still coming off the interest from Alfred Nobel's original fortune. The prize was first instituted in 1895 by Alfred Nobel, although the first awards were in 1901, but he established the prize in 1895. And Nobel, of course, was the inventor of dynamite. And he was very concerned about uh, what dynamite might do. And obviously he was using dynamite for the benefit of mankind, you know, to excavate the ground for buildings and tunnels, etc but he recognized that it could also be used to the detriment of mankind. So he wanted to leave his fortune, which was immense, uh, to be given out every year in the form of Nobel Prizes to top researchers in the world. And uh, that tradition has been followed ever since. And the first uh, prize this year, first announcement at least was for the uh, Medicine and Physiology uh, Prize. And this uh, was awarded uh, this year to two professors who shared the uh, award and uh, Professor David Julius, University of California and uh, Professor Ardham Patapudian from Scripps Research Institute uh, shared this prize. I don't know very much about the work of uh, Professor Patapudian. Of course, I will now read up about it and I'm sure we will all learn, but I did know of Dr. Uh, Julius because of his research interest. And his research interest, believe it or not, was in uh, hot peppers. And this is something that I've been long interested in uh, chemically because it's such a fascinating uh, phenomenon. Anyway, the Nobel Prizes this year were awarded for studying how the body uh, senses uh, uh, pain, how the body uh, senses temperature, and uh, how the body senses uh, touch. The touch part is the one that I don't know very much about uh, and that uh, we will learn, but uh, uh, Professor Julius's work is, uh, is very interesting. So let me talk a little bit about um, you know, hot peppers. The stuff in these hot peppers of which you know, there are many is called capsaicin. That's the main component that causes the sensations that basically we uh, interpret as, as burning. But what happens is that this molecule capsaicin fits into uh, a receptor on the surface of, uh, of nerve cells. Uh, it's, that particular receptor is, is called a specific uh, type of ion channel. Ion channels are a class of receptors that when activated will allow um, ions such as, as calcium and sodium to enter and exit cells. And that is basically what activates a cell. So when capsaicin fits into these receptors on, on the cell, uh, it unleashes a, a, a cascade of reactions that eventually cause reaction in the brain, sensation in, in the brain. So what happens is when the capsaicin uh, activates this particular receptor called the TRPB1 receptor, uh, which is located on the uh, membrane of a cell, that then causes a chemical called substance P to be released and that travels to the brain. And this is the, the chemical that causes the brain to sense pain, essentially. Now, uh, the capsaicin content of different kind of hot peppers varies greatly. And it can be measured by a scale known as the Scoville scale. And uh, the hottest peppers, of course, have the highest numbers on this scale. And this was uh, essentially established by a panel of tasters, pretty brave people, who would uh, test a, a solution of uh, a hot pepper, 
And then the solution with diluted, they would test it again, dilute it again until they couldn't taste anymore. And on that basis, the scale was uh, established, you know, what dilutions had to be carried out until there was no more sensation. So as you can see, uh, when you're up in the 15, 16 million, uh, that would be pure capsaicin. I mean, that would be just totally unbearable if that touched your, um, uh, your mouth. And then we have the pepper sprays that are used by the police that I'll mention in a few minutes. And uh, you kind of go down, down the line until you have the peppers, which normally can be eaten by people. In uh, Louisiana, uh, hot pepper sauces are very, very popular. And a few years ago, when uh, I was in New Orleans, we went into this spice store and they had all kinds of, of uh, hot sauces out for tasting. And there would be a little container and you'd get a cracker and dip it into the container and then carefully taste that, that cracker. And um, I, uh, I thought that this you know, might be an interesting thing to do. And so I went over to the, the counter where they had a, a bottle of uh, Meet Your Maker. Now, the, the title, of course, should have been a warning. Uh, also, the box which obviously was in the shape of a, of a coffin. As I later found out, this particular sauce was rated at 5 million on the Scoville scale, which is very, very hot. Well, as soon as I touched that little cracker to my mouth, uh, experienced the, the most unbelievable burning feeling. Uh, it's something that is really difficult to uh, describe. I mean, if you've eaten any, anything with hot pepper, just you know, mind multiplied by 10, and that's what that was like. Well, what do you do? Uh, rinsing with water is totally useless because capsaicin is not soluble in water. Capsaicin, however, is soluble in fatty materials. So what you need is milk. Uh, and I remember rushing out of that store looking for a store where one could buy milk. And it took a few minutes until we found one. And I just rinsed and rinsed uh, my mouth with, with milk until it subsided, but it took quite some time. So there's a, uh, you know, a little bit to remember that if you should ever be accosted by hot pepper, you gotta look for some fatty material in order to, to uh, dissolve it and water will not do it. Also, I would say that if you are ever cooking with hot peppers, as, as many people do, because you know you put a little bit into the food that can really give it quite a nice tang, you wanna be very careful. I think it's, first of all, not a good idea to do it uh, with bare hands, uh, should wear gloves, uh, because the capsaicin actually can go through the skin and you can get a burning sensation in the hands. Indeed, uh, there was an article a few years ago published in New England Journal of Medicine called Hunan Hand, uh, where a guy had just terrible burning pain right up to his shoulder because he had touched hot peppers after he had been sanding a table and the sandpaper actually had irritated his fingers so that, that uh, there were open cuts on his fingers and the capsaicin went in and, and it was apparently uh, unbearable pain. And this, this was described as Hunan Hans uh, syndrome. Uh, something else that you absolutely do not want to do if you've been handling hot peppers uh, is go to the bathroom. You do not want to be uh, touching that vital part of the anatomy if you've got hot peppers on your hand because that will be a, really a totally memorable experience. On the other hand, sometimes the um, chemistry of the hot pepper can come in handy. You've heard of pepper spray. And uh, again, this is just a concentrated solution of, of capsaicin. And this is what is used by the police to try to uh, calm down riders. And it does work. Let me tell you, if, if you get some, uh, uh, pepper spray in your face, you're going to stop riding and you're going to do that very quickly uh, because it's just a, a terrible burning sensation. The same substance, capsaicin, is um, also used in bear spray because apparently it deters bears. 
And I say apparently because this is not a not something that has been experimented with a great deal. Uh, there are not too many volunteers who are going to see whether or not they can keep a grizzly bear away by using this pepper spray. But um, uh, out west, when you go hiking in uh, in uh, Alberta, uh, in the national park, you can actually rent uh, bear spray and uh, hope that if you come across a bear, it works. There's something else that is very interesting about capsaicin. If you are exposed to a high concentration of it, instead of triggering pain, it actually dulls it because somehow uh, it floods the cell and it prevents it from releasing more substance P. It causes all the substance P to have been eliminated from the cell so that there's no more to be released. And uh, this comes in handy when uh, someone is suffering from the pain of shingles, for example. Uh, shingles can be a terrible affliction and uh, you get the, these outbreaks on, on the body. And um, it can be, uh, basically the pain can be quelled, calmed down by using uh, capsaicin uh, gel. Also squirrels. You know that uh, squirrels, of course, are uh, notorious for wanting to get at uh, bird seed. So you might want to use this substance, capsaicin, to keep the squirrel from doing that. And it works because squirrels are, are like we are bothered by capsaicin. But then, of course, the question might be, if you spray that uh, bird feeder or, or, or they, the seeds themselves with capsaicin, what is that going to do for the birds? Well, interestingly, it's going to do nothing for the birds. Birds do not have a receptor for capsaicin so that you can happily spray your uh, bird feeder with uh, capsaicin. It will keep the squirrels away and uh, not the birds. <laughs> but of course, you want to be very careful if you're using any kind of pepper spray. Uh, because um, if you get that on some part of your body, it will be a very memorable occasion. <clears throat> so that's my little piece on the Nobel Prize that was awarded this morning uh, for research really that started out with capsaicin. <clears throat> and the, the focus of the research is, is uh, how uh, our body senses heat and uh, how uh, substance P is released and what can be done in order to uh, try to alleviate pain using these uh, concepts. Now, uh, this uh, research by Dr. David Julius actually goes back to the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, it's not unusual for a Nobel Prize to be rewarded for work that was done uh, quite some time ago, because there is, of course, a backlog of uh, very uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exciting uh, research that has been done. So uh, it, people were expecting that uh, uh, the developers of the vaccines for COVID-19 might be getting the uh, prize this year, uh, but uh, they uh, uh, undoubtedly will get uh, a prize at some time. Uh, there's still a chance that that may happen this year because uh, it is possible that the prize for uh, the vaccine, um, or at least for work leading up to the vaccine, uh, will be awarded as the chemistry prize, which will be coming in a few days. So we're looking forward to the physics prize, chemistry prize, and later on the uh, prize for economics, the prize for literature, and the peace prize. So this time of the year, as I said, is very interesting in the chemical community. All right. Well, uh, I wasn't uh, planning on talking about this today, but uh, it just so happened that the prize was announced. So I thought it was you know, interesting. And uh, uh, now you know what this, uh, the Nobel Prize that you'll be hearing a lot about on the news tonight. Uh, you'll know a little bit of what it's all about. All right. Let's get down to some of the interesting stories that uh, I do want to discuss with you uh, today. And first, we're going back to Russia in the 1800s, the late 1800s, and the story of the mad monk, Grigory Rasputin. Rasputin was uh, born in, in Siberia, and from very early on in his life, he was known as a ladies' man. 
And uh, that is, you know, uh, demonstrated in this picture here, surrounded by uh, women. And then when he moved to Moscow, he just became the toast of the town. Uh, he became a real ladies' man. And uh, he was especially appreciated by the Empress Alexandra. Now, the Empress Alexandra was the granddaughter of, uh, of Queen Victoria. And this is where the story gets very interesting because Queen Victoria was a carrier of what has been called the royal disease, which is hemophilia. Uh, hemophiliacs, um, uh, blood does not clot properly. So if a hemophiliac is injured, they will bleed, and this can be a life-threatening situation. Now, neither the queen nor her granddaughter uh, had the disease. They were just carriers of the gene. But unfortunately, uh, the son of uh, Alexandra, uh, Alexei Nikolaevich, uh, the so-called Tsarevich of Russia, uh, did develop uh, hemophilia. And um, obviously, uh, he had to be uh, handled very carefully, no real playing in any kind of way where he could uh, hurt himself because the bleeding would be a real problem. And uh, interestingly enough, it was um, this young boy and his treatment by Rasputin that endeared Rasputin to, um, to the princess. How so? Because in those days, aspirin, believe it or not, was tried for the treatment of hemophilia. It sounds bizarre because we know that aspirin actually has an anti-clotting effect. This is the last thing that you want in your body if you are a hemophiliac. But aspirin had been discovered, uh, or at least first synthesized in the late 1800s by Felix Hoffmann at the Bio Company in Germany. He's the same researcher who also synthesized heroin. And these two drugs were thought to be, you know, comparable at that time. They were both equally promoted by, by, the, by the company. Now, of course, aspirin was a very effective painkiller and a very effective fever reducer. So it was a great drug. And there were not that many drugs available in those days. And when you had a new drug that certainly was, you know, was obviously uh, uh, active for one condition, uh, such as, you know, a fever and pain, you try it for other things. And scientific knowledge was, was, you know, not that great in those days. So they thought maybe it could also work against uh, hemophilia. Obviously, aspirin is the wrong thing to give for hemophilia. And Rasputin basically endeared himself to uh, uh, the poor boy's mother by suggesting that they stop the use of all medications because he was going to heal the boy with, with prayer. Well, of course, the prayer didn't have much of an effect, but eliminating the aspirin did. So the boy actually did better and therefore Rasputin became famous. In fact, so famous that the other noblemen in the court were jealous of him because he had undue influence over the czar and they decided to do away with him. And that attempt was led by Prince Felix uh, Yusupov. And they decided that they were going to invite Rasputin to a dinner and poison him. And they were going to poison him with, uh, with cyanide. Cyanide, of course, is a very potent uh, poison. So they were on the right track with that. And as the story goes, they made a chocolate cake in which uh, that they heavily laced with, um, uh, with cyanide. And uh, Rasputin actually ate the cake, but nothing happened. <laughs> they couldn't explain this. So they panicked, drew out their guns and they shot him and they threw him into the river. He didn't die right away. Eventually he was washed up, but it seemed that he was alive for quite some time um, in the river. Scientists have uh, proposed explanations for what happened here. 
why did the Sinai not kill Rasputin? It wasn't because of any kind of supernatural intervention. The theory is that the cyanide was old. The bottle of cyanide was old and it was exposed to uh, acidic vapors because carbon dioxide in the air dissolves in moisture and it forms carbonic acid. And if carbonic acid reacts with potassium cyanide, it will convert it to hydrogen cyanide, which is volatile. So over the years, because of uh, the acidic moisture to which um, uh, this uh, bottle of cyanide was exposed, the theory is that all of the HCN had uh, diffused out and all that was left in the bottle was potassium carbonate. And of course that is not lethal and that is why uh, Rasputin survived. Now, of course, potassium cyanide is, is uh, extremely toxic. Uh, we know this. This is the stuff that was known as Zyklon B, uh, used in the gas chambers in, uh, in Auschwitz and in other um, uh, concentration camps. And uh, what, uh, the way that this worked was that the potassium cyanide was reacted with sulfuric acid to release the hydrogen cyanide gas, which then was piped into the gas chambers. And uh, when you inhale hydrogen cyanide gas, death uh, is, is very quick. Uh, indeed, the United States, in some states for some years, they used hydrogen cyanide gas to carry out executions. And uh, here is uh, uh, one of those execution chambers in the US and Southern US in, in New Mexico. And uh, the um, person to be executed would be tied down into that chair. And underneath the chair, was um, a, a vial or a, a container of potassium cyanide and there was a tube and you can see the the uh, the tube just behind the uh, behind the chair and uh, the cyanide is underneath the chair you can't quite see it here and sulfuric acid would be poured down that tube it would mix with the uh, potassium cyanide release hydrogen cyanide gas and within a couple of minutes the victim would die but then this uh, eventually was determined to be uh, uh, not ethical because the person would struggle uh, and you know until uh, they took in enough cyanide to uh, make them unconscious so uh, this is no longer done and they have uh, switched to lethal injections execution via lethal injection and the uh, this time the uh, person to be executed is strapped down onto uh, a table and uh, they are first uh, put to sleep with sodium thiopental which is a barbiturate and then uh, pancurium bromide is administered that's a derivative of curare and that paralyzes the muscles and then uh, potassium chloride is injected uh, and that stops the heart and apparently this uh, this is a painless way to go because uh, the sodium thiopantal puts them to sleep uh, right away. <clears throat> but this is uh, obviously a deadly mix and uh, nobody has come back from, from this. Now the reason I say that is because this gets us into another very interesting uh, experience, so, or at least phenomena that some people have experienced that they refer to as the near-death experience. And the claim here is that they have actually died for a few minutes uh, before being revived, being resuscitated. Uh, and they had some amazing experience before they came back to life. People have described this after undergoing surgery, saying that all of a sudden they felt that they were leaving their body floating up out of their body and actually were looking down on themselves and on the surgeons. They were kind of in a limbo between life and death until the surgery was successful and then they floated back into their body. Now this is very interesting because a lot of people report this kind of experience. And people who have had no contact with each other, who have not heard such stories, report it. They also report that while they felt that they were floating out of their body, they felt like they were going down a tunnel 
which had a bright light at the end. And often they will describe that they saw their departed relatives motioning for them to come. And then all of a sudden, their arms would go up and say, halt, don't come. And that's when they were revived. And they tell the story, claiming that, that you know, uh, they were almost in heaven. I mean, that's, I think, how most people would interpret the uh, white light. It seems that nobody, when they're having one of these near-death experiences, uh, sees fire and brimstone and the devil at the end of that, uh, that tunnel. So it's just an interesting phenomenon uh, for which science has no real uh, you know, explanation. Uh, and it's not a new idea. Uh, if we go back to the uh, 16th century, Hieronymus Bosch, who painted a number of very, very interesting uh, paintings, painted this one. And look at the top of this painting where what we see is the kind of tunnel that people describe again with the light at the end and people going towards that tunnel, angels carrying them up towards, uh, towards the light. And uh, some people actually claim that uh, these are real visions of heaven and that heaven is a real thing. For example, Leslie Keen has written a book on this, Surviving Death, and uh, describes this uh, you know, uh, uh, experience and uh, you know, believes that this is evidence that there is an afterlife, that the people who have had this near-death experience actually have for a few moments seen what we are all going to see when the end comes. Well, I'm very suspicious of this. Uh, I think that there likely is some kind of uh, reasonable scientific explanation here. I think um, if, um, uh, the brain or at least part of the brain for a few moments is, is uh, impaired, maybe starved of oxygen, that, that triggers some kind of hallucination. Because we know that people can have uh, very specific hallucinations triggered by, by substances. For example, uh, people who are high on LSD will very often describe that they feel that their body is coming apart, that their limbs are dissociating from, from their bodies. And these are people who I've never met, you know, and yet they all describe the same kind of sensation. So it's, it's also possible that, that uh, uh, something happens in the brain that triggers a certain vision, such as, you know, being flooded with, with light. But basically nobody uh, really knows. But uh, I, I'm uh, certainly suspicious of, Leslie Keen and, and uh, what she has written in this book, because she has also written about uh, UFOs in a decidedly non-scientific fashion. Uh, she believes that uh, this is you know, a phenomenon that is being covered up and that we are being visited by aliens, uh, etc. Well, the term UFO, I think all of us believe in UFOs because a UFO just means that it's an ident unidentified flying object. It doesn't mean that we're looking at flying saucers that have come from outer space, but anything that is up in the sky that hasn't been identified is called a, a UFO. Although these days, uh, the uh, scientific community is more likely to use unidentified aerial phenomena because that kind of comes with, with less baggage than uh, UFO. So let's face it, if you're out there, and you see something like this flying uh, across your field of vision, until you have identified that as a Frisbee thrown by someone, you have seen a UFO. Then of course it becomes an IFO, an identified flying object. Well, of course, over the years, uh, sightings of UFOs has, have been widely reported and also widely photographed. But isn't it strange that all of the pictures that we see of, of UFOs look like they were taken with a camera made in the 1930s and the picture was taken by someone suffering from Parkinson's disease. How is it that these days 
when there are billions of cell phones, literally billions of cell phones all over the world, and billions of pictures being taken every day of all kinds of things, but nobody ever seems to have their camera ready when one of these UFOs is around to take a proper, clear picture. Now, it certainly is true that sightings of UFOs are, are widely reported. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a map of the United States uh, where people report sightings. But once again, you know, if, if you see, look up in the sky and you see something unusual, you've seen a UFO, but it might be a weather balloon. It might be a strange cloud formation. It might be a reflection from an airplane. Uh, or of course, it might be an alien spacecraft. But that is not very likely. Now, to tell you the truth, I think that uh, most scientists would agree that there has to be life somewhere else in the universe, probably many, many types of, of, of lives. Because how likely is it that the only place where life evolved would be on this insignificant little planet in an insignificant solar system in an essentially insignificant galaxy in this vast universe where there are billions and billions of potential the you know planets where life could have evolved like like the earth why would it have only happened here on the other hand the distances in the universe are so huge that it is very hard to conceive visitors from anywhere. Because I think we, we can certainly uh, agree on the fact that there uh, are no forms of, of, of life in our planetary system between here and, and Pluto. So the next planetary system where there conceivably could be a so-called Goldilocks planet which has just the right air, water, everything to evolve life. You're talking about light years away. That's a phenomenal distance. And not likely uh, that, that there can be technology to overcome you know, the, the difficulty of traveling those kind of distances. But of course, over the years, we've had all kinds of reports here about landings of, of spacecraft. The most famous one is Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, when supposedly a flying saucer landed. And uh, there were headlines that were even backed up by the military that this had happened. And there were also pieces, supposedly, of this uh, spacecraft that had been recovered. And there were stories that even aliens who had crashed with this spacecraft were spirited away by the military where they were autopsied and experimented upon. And we even saw the footage from so-called alien autopsy that was uh, somehow uh, secretly uh, released. And it's a very interesting uh, video if you look at it and uh, uh, curious video it looks like it you know this could be some some sort of uh, of alien but there are many giveaways that this of course was just fraudulent uh, here is one uh, basically trivial uh, you'll see the telephone in the back and you see the coiled wire well those coiled wires on telephones did not exist when this autopsy supposedly uh, took place but Roswell, New Mexico, since then has become a tourist mecca uh, for alien visitations, but the only aliens there are people who are not from Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, there are all kinds of, of restaurants with UFO themes, museums, etc. Well, what actually happened there to precipitate this story? We know because the government has actually Close the case on this, and we have the final Roswell report. Of course, uh, people who believe that aliens really had landed there will claim that this is fake news, that it's all a cover-up. But uh, what really happened there 
was that the US was experimenting with high altitude balloons in order to try to monitor Soviet rocket launches. And uh, they were even experimenting uh, with possibly putting people into these balloons at a very high altitude to be observers. So in order to see whether this would work, they launched balloons with mannequins. And these mannequins were the size of, of, of people. And they launched a number of, of these balloons, experimental balloons. And they were manned by mannequins. Well, it turned out that one of these indeed did crash in Roswell, New Mexico, where a farmer witnessed the crash. And they saw Air Force trucks very quickly approach the landing site and take everything away. And of course, this is what started the whole myth that uh, aliens had been captured. The reason everything was spirited away was because this was a, a top secret operation, because this was during the height of the Cold War and they were really spying on um, uh, Soviet rocket launches. But it made for a very, very tantalizing story. Uh, of course, when you take a look at what I showed you before, the supposed remnants of, of, of the spacecraft, they don't look remnants of spacecraft at all. They, they look like pieces of a, of a balloon, which is exactly what, uh, what this was. There have been other incidents, of course, around the world. Uh, there was one in, in England. Uh, again, a lot of publicity just outside of a U.S. Air Force base in England. There's even a monument uh, uh, there. And this uh, uh, monument basically is, uh, 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 was placed where they supposedly saw the, the uh, landing uh, ship. But what they actually saw was a reflection of a uh, light from a light tower, which was some distance away. But the atmospheric conditions were such, it was very foggy and it, it, uh, it looked like the light was coming, you know, from much, much, much closer. And this is what gave rise to this uh, UFO incident. And then the monument is, uh, is still there, but it actually was light from a, a lighthouse. Well, just recently, we had this preliminary assessment of unidentified aerial phenomena uh, by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in the US. So this is not a quack organization. And uh, they showed fic pictures like this actually taken by uh, pilots uh, and they did not know what this was. So we have this situation here where there actually were some flying objects recorded by pilots and no one is ex exactly sure what uh, this really was. But that does not mean that these were alien aircraft, uh, which is of course the most remote of all uh, possibilities. Because first of all, how would they ever approach the earth without having been seen before? Why would they all of a sudden appear just you know, at 30,000 feet or, or, or whatever? Uh, but uh, you know the the uh, the stories are are intriguing, and even the New New Yorker has published a story uh, about uh, the Pentagon now starting to take UFO seriously. Yes, they are talking to take take it seriously because there really are some unidentified flying objects, which which may perhaps be some kind of novel weaponry developed by the Soviets or the Chinese. Nobody knows. But just because they're investigating it, that does not mean that they think that we're being visited by aliens from outer space. Then, of course, there are those who claim to have been kidnapped by UFOs, by, by um, aliens. Uh, again, makes for very intriguing stories. One of the most famous ones uh, was the one story that was told by Barney and Betty Hill. And there's an interesting Munchal connection here because uh, they were actually driving back through the mountains in New Hampshire from Montreal to their home in the States, when all of a sudden they realized that they were missing two hours of their time. And uh, eventually it came to them that during those two hours they had been kidnapped uh, by uh, aliens uh, who had hovered above their truck uh, in a flying saucer. And I mean, this uh, silly story <laughs> uh, even is commemorated uh, on the highway where it supposedly happened in, in, uh, in New Hampshire. 
well, obviously there's no physical evidence at all that anything like this has happened, but it's a story that, that gets told over and over again. And of course, it gives rise to some cartoons as well. Here's an interesting one. I mean, these days with COVID-19, uh, we really can't travel anywhere. So uh, being kidnapped by aliens might be uh, an exciting adventure. A lot of people, of course, believe uh, in flying saucers. Well, many people believe things that just are not true. And this uh, takes us to something we call the Mandela Effect which is a very, very interesting uh, effect. The, exp the term actually was first coined by a lady by the name of Fiona Broom in this, uh, uh, in this book. Now she's a paranormal consultant, which of course right away uh, causes one to be suspicious. And uh, she details in his book, how she remembered that uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, who was president of, uh, eventually, of course, uh, president of uh, South Africa, actually died in prison. And the reason that she tells the story is because this was her memory. And when she told the story to other people, they agreed with her that that's what they remembered also. But this is just absolutely not the case. Nelson Mandela was born in 1918 and he died in 2013 after he had been president of South Africa. He had spent about 30 years in jail, but he did not die in jail. So the story just is not true. So this has been termed the Mandela effect. It's a phenomenon that occurs when large groups of people believe something happened, even though there's evidence that it isn't true. In the case of Nelson Mandela, we know exactly when he died. So we know that he didn't die in prison. But our uh, friend, Arthur Broom, has an interesting analysis of why she is so confused and why she thought that this had happened. Because she believed that there are parallel universes where things happen in a different way. And somehow she just switched into a different universe where Mandela actually did die in prison before coming back to this universe. I mean, I, it's kind of funny even to talk about things like this, you know, parallel universes, but that is her explanation. And there are other theories that go around that uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research carried out experiments that caused the world to shift into alternative reality where Donald Trump has become president. Well, I wish that that were an alternate reality, it isn't. He really was president. And who knows, he may be again. The, the interesting uh, business here though about the Mandela effect is that we have to ask the question whether or not we can trust our own memory. Because there are so many things that people are absolutely convinced about, which just are not the case. For example, this gentleman, that's Alexander Hamilton. When you do surveys, people, most people think that Alexander Hamilton was one of the presidents of the US, which of course he was not. So again, this is a typical example of the Mandela effect where people are convinced that something happened, which just never happened. I'll give you some other interesting examples. Uh, some of them are funny and curious. I suspect many of you have read to your grandchildren uh, stories like this, about the Bernstein Bears. Now, when you take a look at the missing letter there, the question that I would ask you is, what letter goes in, into the empty space there? And most people would say, letter E, that these books were all about the Bernstein Bears. Not the case. It actually is the Bernstein Bears because that was the name of the authors who wrote these uh, stories. But even TV Guide got this wrong and had it as the Berenstein Bears. All right, give you another example. When you ask people where, what Darth Vader said about Luke being his son, the line that is always quoted is Luke, I am your father. 
No, he never said that. He never said, Luke, the line was, no, I am your father. Then there was this uh, sitcom, very, very popular. What was the title of that sitcom? Well, most people will say that sitcom was Sex in the City. It was not. The title of that show was Sex and the City. When you ask people about the gentleman who is um, a kind of the logo for the Monopoly game, and you ask what he's wearing on his face, most people will say that he's wearing a monocle. Not true. You can take a look at your Monopoly game. He is wearing nothing. So where does this false memory come from? Because Mr. Peanut wears a monocle and people get this confused in their minds. Another interesting example of a Mandela effect, classic movie, of course, Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks. What is the line? You ask people, they say, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That is not the line. The line is life was like a box of chocolates. You ask people if they've seen the movie Shazam and many will tell you that they saw that Shazam movie. And uh, they will even describe to you the, the plot and how it uh, was the genie was played by Simbad. No. Simbad never played a genie in Shazam. There was a movie called Kazam, but there never was any, any Shazam. Mandela effect. Snow White, classic Disney movie. Mirror, mirror on the wall, right? That's what people think. No, that's not what the queen said. She said, magic mirror on the wall, magic mirror on the wall. Then there's my favorite, because uh, this one really got me. I was absolutely sure that in the movie Terms of Endearment, Jack Nicholson says uh, uh, to Shirley, uh, I'd rather stick rusty needles in my eyeballs. I was absolutely sure of that. And I myself have used that many many times you know when i don't want to do something i'd say i'd rather stick rusty needles in my eyeballs uh, i tell you i was really really surprised when um, uh, i rewatched that movie and uh, the line was just not there what he actually says i'd rather stick needles in my eyes i was just flabbergasted by that anyway this is the mandela effect which is Interesting. Well, this gives us an in, also an interesting transition into chicken McNuggets. Because people here believe all kinds of things that are not true at all. What McDonald's chicken nuggets, what do they really contain? Well, I wrote a column about this in the, in the Mancho Gazette a while ago. And I explained what the chicken McNuggets really contain. You know what they contain? They contain chicken. That's what they are made of. However, there are all kinds of articles out there on the internet that uh, attack McDonald's chicken McNuggets for several reasons. Uh, these two chemicals are uh, targets for that attack. Uh, one of them uh, that you see on, on the left there is polysiloxane, which is a silicone. And the other one is tertiary butyl hydroquinone. Now, the T-butyl hydroquinone is added in very, very small amounts to the oil in which the chicken is fried in order to prevent um, uh, any oxidation. Because uh, you probably know that uh, oils, when they're exposed to the air, uh, can become rancid when they react with oxygen. So tertiary butyl hydroquinone is what we refer to as an antioxidant. Now, in any other context, people love antioxidants because they think that it prevents all kinds of diseases. The chemical on the left is polysiloxane, 
it's an anti-foaming agent in this case, because when you fry foods, sometimes you, the oil foams up and you wanna prevent that from happening. So small amount of this is added. Well, the TBHQ, tertiary butyl hydroquinone, you do not need very much. Uh, the, in fact, the total amount that is allowed is about 0.02% of the, of the oil, which is essentially an insignificant uh, amount. It is a properly regulated food additive. That is, you, you can't just randomly put things into food. You have to pass them by regulatory agencies. It is of course true that in extremely high doses, this can be toxic. Anything in an extremely high dose can be toxic. But in reality, you would have to eat 313 nuggets to approach the toxic dose of one gram. And even people who are absolutely infatuated with McNuggets are not going to eat 313 of them. But there's all kinds of false information like this that, that, that goes around. For example, in this book here, Ruth Winter, Consumer's Dictionary of Food Additives. She attacks tertiary butyl hydroquinone. This is what she says. TBHQ is a form of butane or lighter fluid and ingesting amounts as little as one gram of TBHQ can cause nausea, vomiting, ringing in the ears, delirium, sense of suffocation and co collapse. Well, the one gram part here is true, but I just told you that no one could ever approach that because no one could eat that much. Uh, those many pieces of, of, uh, of this, this chicken. But the first part of the sentence is utter nonsense. TBHQ is not a form of butane or lighter fluid. The term butyl just refers to a four carbon segment in a molecule. And as you saw before, there, there is a side branch of TBHQ that has four carbons in it. Nothing to do with lighter fluid. But this is just there because the the author really has no knowledge of chemistry and is just a way to scare people. Now, she's not the only one who does this. Joe Mercola, uh, who is a fiend, an absolute fiend when it comes to, to uh, spreading false information. Uh, but he has built a huge empire on the internet. And in fact, he is now regarded as the most influential spreader of, of misinformation about coronavirus. And just this week, uh, YouTube has removed his channel and Facebook has taken, taken him off. This, this man uh, is, a, is a criminal. He's an anti-vaxxer, anti-mask, anti-science, everything. And of course, he's anti-chicken McNuggets. In this case, he talks about the uh, polysiloxane, the silicone that I, I, I mentioned. And he says, did you know that the stuff that they are using to make chicken McNuggets is the same thing that they used to make silly putty? Well, actually that happens to be true, but they use a tiny amount uh, of this. And the fact is that if you wanted to eat silly putty, you probably could. Now I'm not encouraging anyone to do that, but I don't think anything would happen. It would come out the other end. In fact, silicones such as this are even used as medication. For example, this uh, uh, anti-gas medication for people who feel bloated is based upon uh, silicone because it does exactly the same thing as it does in the oil. It prevents the formation of gas bubbles and there's no health issue here uh, whatsoever. Uh, this kind of silliness is, is um, even repeated by Michael Pollan, uh, who should know better. Uh, the book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, is actually a very good book, uh, but he's got some of the silliness in there, including that McDonald's chicken McNucket is made up mostly of corn. You know how he comes to this conclusion? Because he calculates that chickens eat corn and the corn is converted into meat in the animal's body. So they're really made up of corn. First of all, there would be nothing wrong with eating corn anyway. But if you're going to use this kind of logic, we could say that we are mostly plant material because everything we eat originally comes from plants. So it's just kind of a silly argument to try to 
steer people away from eating foods such as chicken McNuggets. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no objection to steering people away from eating these fast foods. They are high in fat. They are high in salt. That's the reason to stay away from them. Not because they may contain some terms with unpronounceable names or because they contain uh, a substance that is also used to make silly putty. Just because a substance is used in one context doesn't mean that you can't use it elsewhere. I mean, we drink water, even though water, of course, is the ingredient that we use to make cement. So just because it's used in cement doesn't mean we can't drink it. Just because uh, silicones are used to make silly putty doesn't mean that we can't uh, eat these as well. But I tell you one final comment here. After I wrote that column uh, about um, chicken McNuggets, explaining that we don't have anything to fear about the TBHQ or the polycyloxane, but I was also very clear that I do not advocate eating these other than as you know an occasional treat because the high fat or salt content. I got letters, abusive letters, uh, some of them questioning the marital status of my parents, questioning my IQ, uh, some suggesting that I must be paid off by big food to say these things. But you know what was really interesting here is that I was equally attacked from both sides. I was attacked by people, of course, who claim that chicken McNuggets are tantamount to, to a poison and that I was justifying eating these. But I was also attacked by the other side, <laughs> you know, who was claiming that that I, I was uh, uh, basically saying that there were danger substances in chicken McNuggets and was agreeing with with all of the nonsensical uh, rhetoric. So you just can't win. But what is interesting is that I got, I think, more abusive letters and emails about that column than just about anything else. People, people get so upset when someone challenges uh, what they have made up their minds about. So that's it for today. You learned a little bit about the Mandela effect, uh, a little bit history there about Rasputin, and also uh, something that just uh, took place today, which was the awarding of the Nobel Prize in Medicine and uh, Physiology, and it's connection to hot peppers. So that's it for today. Uh, and uh, if, if anyone has any questions, certainly I can uh, try to answer it about whatever crosses your mind. Do we have any questions? Uh, Dr. Joe, I just saw a comment come in from Freema saying, thank you, Dr. Joe, for a very interesting lecture. And someone appears to have their hand up. So I'm going to allow Gail to speak. Uh, Gail, if you could just unmute yourself, please, and okay. ask a question. Okay, I unmuted. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, since I want to go to Florida, if the doctor knows anything about the testing and test kinds that well are you have needed. to get you have to get tested before you go yeah but what kind of test is acceptable because from here to florida i need an antigen yes but from florida to here i need a pcr do you That's know right. what's the difference yes there's a difference the pcr test is more reliable uh so, uh, yeah, Canada wants you to have the PCR test when you're coming back. And you cannot get it here and take it with you to Florida, can you? No, you can, no. You have to no. get it over there. You have to get it there. But why do you want to go to Florida? Because it's warmer. Yeah, but it's the hotbed of stupidity. I think it's the yeah, greatest concentration of, of stupid people in the world. Yeah, I know, but I can't take it to stay in my apartment locked up for six months. 
And I, and besides that, I get all kinds of rheumatism and pain in my bones. Yeah. I'm elderly a little bit. A little well, bit, then just you a take the chance. I mean, uh, uh, you know, traveling, getting older. I don't have to go to a hotel chance, and I'm but... not traveling on the road, which yeah. I do. I am flying this time. I actually, usually the, take the, the car and the, drive. I, I think the flying is, is, is actually quite safe. Uh, the air circulation on airplanes is very good. Plus, that's they, what I hear. Yeah, you, you have to wear a mask on the plane. Yeah, yeah. And what's so, the difference uh, between the N95 and the KN95 mask? Nothing for practical purposes, nothing. But it's really not worth wearing the N95. They, they, you know, blue surgical masks are good enough. Yeah, okay, thank you very okay. much. All right, enjoyed your uh, thank your, you, uh, chicken McNuggets. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Gail, for your question. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, Dr. Schwartz. We had another uh, comment thanking you for a very interesting lecture in the meantime. Okay. So we'll, we'll repeat this uh, next month. Don't know exactly what we'll talk about. Depends on what happens till then. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz. Okay. Bye. Have a great Thank afternoon. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye.